So uh, our final talk today, which I think fits perfectly with what Dr. Freeman was just doing in our start, brings us right up to the present moment and is going to address an ongoing situation in China. If you have been following the international news at all, you're probably at least broadly aware of the detentions and forced labor taking place in Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. And so um, I'm wondering and thinking about as we listen to this, how can you use discussion about different slaveries or different styles of forced labor to help your students make sense of this current situation? So a colleague at the Center for Silk Road Studies kindly pointed me in the direction of Dr. Laura Murphy. Fortuitously, she and Nairola Elima, I'm sorry, tell me if I mispronounced your name, um, were just publishing a report entitled In Broad Daylight, Uyghur Forced Labor and Global Solar Supply Chains. And um, so that's what they'll be, they'll be talking about that situation today. Laura Murphy is Professor of Human Rights and Contemporary Slavery at the Helena Kennedy Center for International Justice at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. So that's where she's joining us from. She is the author of a number of publications about contemporary slavery, including The New Slave Narrative, A Battle Over Representations of Contemporary Slavery and Metaphor, Metaphor in the Slave Trade in West African Literature, um, which I selected just because I think they might be interesting to you if you teach about this. Um, and in thinking about your making past present connections in your teaching, you may be interested to know that she is particularly focused on survivor narrative and testimony by people who have been enslaved. So that might provide some interesting connections. Um, Nairola Elima, now would be a great time if you please tell me if I said that wrong. Nairola Elima. Nairola Elima, my apologies. Is a supply chain analyst. No, no, no. <laughs> What's that? Oh, no problem, okay. No worries. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is a supply chain analyst who works regularly with the Helena Kennedy Center's forced labor lab at Sheffield Hallam University. And she provides expertise on a whole host of subjects necessary to understanding labor in the globalized world. Interesting side note for any of you, if you have students who are interested in business. Um, so she focuses on Chinese corporate structures, supply chain mapping, and what's called ESG risk assessment. That's environmental, social, and governance risk assessment. She has also lived, studied, and worked in Xinjiang, Beijing, Shanghai, and a number of other Chinese cities, as well as currently outside the PRC. So now, after I actually did my intro, um, welcome to Professor Laura Murphy and Nirola Elema. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, you know, the first uh, thing in our slide show is gratitude because we are extremely grateful to be able to be here. I taught, I've taught everything from eighth grade through to graduate students um, at a variety of different kinds of institutions. And I take teaching very seriously. I consider it my vocation. And so I love any opportunity I, I can get to talk to um, to other teachers. And I'm also grateful to you, uh, the presenters that came before me uh, for setting the stage and, 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 and never alone, um, for setting the stage because we had an opportunity and we're, we apologize for not being able to be here. We had every intention to, but we had an opportunity to talk to people who would be able to do something significant about the issue that we're gonna talk about today um, in the hours before uh, we were presenting. And so we otherwise would never have missed this for the world. I, I'm sorry I missed the opportunity to learn from you, um, but we, we couldn't pass up this opportunity. Um, as uh, Shane was saying, uh, we have recently come out with a report uh, about the Uyghur, about Uyghur forced labor. Um, you can find it on our, our website at the Helena Kennedy Center. And um, I, with that said, I'm just gonna kick it off to Nirola and uh, let her tell you a little bit about where she's coming from and about the kinds of forced labor that we're finding. We're not gonna focus on solar today, although we are happy to answer questions about it all the time. Um, but for now, we'll talk about the broad strokes of what's happening in the Uyghur region. Go ahead. Uh, I want to start our presentation by sharing my family story about what has been happening in the Uyghur region for the last few years. Um, in 2017, after six years living in Sweden, I decided to return home to meet my family and my friends. 
the trip was supposed to be a surprise. I had all that in my mind how I would just knock the door and my parents would be so surprised to see me. I was so excited, but thanks to the fact that I couldn't keep a secret, uh, so I eventually told my mother that uh, I will visit them soon. However, she immediately told me, do not come back, things have changed, now is not the right time. I wasn't confused, I understand it, because that is how the situation has been in Xinjiang uh, since 2009. Uh, the authority policy toward Uyghur can be very tough, but in my mind, I am safe, my family is safe. Uh, after all, the authority has been telling us they're only targeting on the three evils, so some separatist extremist terrorists who do not want a beautiful and a stable Xinjiang. Majority of Uyghur's life are full of inconvenience because all of these policies specific target toward Uyghur, uh, such as hotel will reject, reject Uyghur people by claiming there were no rooms available and the hotel, those hotel who accept Uyghur visiting, uh, visitors, they will get filed. Uh, it is immensely difficult for Uyghur people can get a passport. Anyway, so Uyghur, uh, it's a tough for Uyghur people, but we endure it. So I decide to wait for the right time to return home, which I'm still waiting for, and it seems it may never going to happen. Late in 2017, most of my Uyghur friends gradually deleted me from WeChat, uh, a Chinese social app, then my relatives, then my cousin. Uh, Uyghur people I know abroad, they start to look for their family soon enough in March 2018. My cousin, as you see in the picture, she disappeared. Later, I found out that my cousin was abducted to a concentration camp, one of China's so-called vacational training centers. Uh, more than 1. million people are estimated to have been sent to this mass cap system. There are more than 380 documented camps established across the region since 2017, uh, from the lowest re-education camp to the fortified prisons. We have heard firsthand testimonies that people in the camp have been systematically raped, sexually abused, and tortured. And my cousin? She was diagnosed with the liver damage after her first release. Uh, when it comes to concentration camps, the Chinese government has claimed that the camp in the Uyghur region offer Chinese language tutoring, ideological training, and vocational skills to unemployed and impoverished uh, citizens, such as Uyghur. My cousin worked both as an insurance saleswoman and as a Mandarin tutor to Uyghur people before she was taken to a concentration camp. She, knew, she needs no education, no vocational skill training. She needs no poverty elevation program, but she was not alone. Raila Dawood, next slide, please. <laughs> Laura, next slide. Raila Dawood, uh, She's, she was a professor of the Xinjiang University. She's also someone Laura knows. Uh, Abdelkader Jalaidin, also a professor, and my friend Nurisman, entire family. They have all been in one of these camps, and there are more. Next slide, please. Thank you. And under the international pressure, as you see this blue picture, it's very famous when it's come to the Uyghur re-education camp, Chinese uh, re-education camp. So under the international pressure, the Chinese government claimed all the students have graduated from the camps. In reality, the Chinese government is escalating prosecution even further. In some case, uh, like my cousin, she was brought to a high security prison uh, only four months after she's supposed to graduation from a concentration camp. In some case, people who are, who are purportedly released or graduate from the concentration camp, internment camp, whatever you call it, are often required as uh, part of their release to work in the factories near the camps. Uh, some case uh, which they were once interned. We heard the testimony of survivor of the camps and also those who risk their life to reveal how they have been forced to work under the, under the threat of further imprisonment. Uh, Laura, next slide, please. Next 
Next. Um, this is your last your, slide. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, is there supposed to be a picture about a nurse? Um, who, oh, yeah. Uh, a nurse oh, wait. No, you're right. You're right. You already covered that. There you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this image is retrieved from the Four Corner program, Tell the Word. Dean North, a Uyghur nurse, has written down that after graduate from the camp, she has been forced to work in a factory. In Xinjiang, everything is under surveillance. People who were sent to the camp just because they have relatives in abroad. Dilma, this woman, she risked her life to begging her sister in Australia to speak out. So in some region, government agents or labor recruits go from house to house and assign each Uyghur and Kazakh people in a point value. The point system will determine how far a person workplace will be from the home. Those who need to control are sent to the training. Uh, all others are sent to the work, either close to the home or across the country. And according to the do uh, government document, all supplies labor force in the judiciary shall be managed by a quantity point system. So as to ensure that all the supplies labor in the judiciary who should be trained are trained and all who should be employed are employed. So if you're Uyghur or Kazakh, if you are unwilling to participate in training or you're able to go elsewhere for employment, but you're not active in seeking employment or have some stubborn thinking, then your point will be taken away. And there's uh, in at Amidin family is uh, one of the uh, family we have been uh, write about in our uh, solar report. Um, they, this couple, they have been living under a constant threat that they, they could well be sent to the camp. They're compelling to work in the uh, Hoshan Silicon industry. Hoshan Silicon industry company is a metallurgical grade silicon producer in the Uyghur region with the highest production cap uh, capacity. And this company not only itself participate in the labor transfer program, and they have significant exposure to forced labor through its quarter supplier. This married couple, they're from Deacon Township, who were targeted for this government poverty elevation uh, program. The local government, they decided that this couple needed an income increasing package. So what happened to this couple? First, a cadre will continue, uh, constantly coming to their home and tell them, well, you need to learn the Chinese language so you can able to leave your hometown to another city to work. And then later, and this couple, this they start to also train this couple working as a welder, and then later they said, "Well, you need now to work in the Hoshan uh, company, Ho Hoshan company." So the couple said, "Well, we have ill parents need to take care of." So the government said, "No worries, we can not take care of it." So they bought the medicine to the parents. And then later the couples, they still said, now you can leave your hometown to work. So the couple said, we, we have a, a seven acre of the brick field we need to tending. So the government said, well, don't worry, we can re reveal your worries. What happened? The government, their, this family's seven acre land has been transferred to state-run institution. The couple lost their land. And what happened eventually? These couples had a very beautiful house in their own hometown, but now they're ended up in a dormitory uh, and uh, in another employee from another city. This couple eventually transferred to Hoshan, more than 50 kilometers away from their home, to work as a mechanic and a product inspector in the Hoshan Silicon Industry Factory, leaving behind their children and their ill parents. And when they finally get a chance to return home, they're being exhibited as a modern worker and citizen in the new recruiting. I have been working with Helena Kennedy Center as a supply chain analyst and a human rights researcher associate in order to help the world to understand how this massive system of forced labor in the Uyghur region functions.
the things I think the most important we have been working on, we're using the uh, government documents, directives, uh, and the company's public documents to present this poverty elevation program in Xinjiang is designed on a logic that indigenous people, Uyghur people, Kazakh people, who, do, who don't actively participate or refuse participate in this uh, surplus labor poverty elevation or labor transfer program, then they're affected by the separatism, extremism, terrorism. If the Uyghur and Kazakh people, the, if they refuse, they were marked as extremists, for example. And this is not the price Uyghur people can pay because in the Chinese government eyes, in their own document, which I quote, they have the duty to round up everyone who should round it up. Under this kind of the threat, no one can walk away from the government poverty elevation program. No one can refuse the government officials arrangement. Chinese company who has been participated in this poverty elevation program playing in a very important role in this process. They have been benefiting from this mass atrocity crimes. This has been and is well affects the uh, global supply chain. Solar industry is just one case and there's more. And I finished my part. Uh, I transfer this to, I give this to the Laura. Thank you, that was incredible. Uh, I've seen you present it before and it gets better every time. Thank you. Um, just, I wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, on the, the story that is unfolding as Nerula is telling it. One, there are 12 million ethnic minority people. Those are Kazakh people of Kazakh descent and of Uyghur descent in China. They are Chinese citizens. Um, and they live in a region called uh, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, it is essentially a colony of China that, um, that has uh, on different occasions throughout its history resisted uh, that colonization, had independent states, uh, sometimes called East Turkestan. So you'll often hear Uyghur people talking about East Turkestan as their like independent state, um, but it is not an independent state at this time. It is, it, is a, it is a colony of China, essentially. It's a contiguous colony. So it, share, it is within the borders of China as, as the world understands it, but it's a region of, of China that, um, that has significant claims to independence and has had a, a very independent culture, economy, uh, and and you know way of life for a very long time, uh, and <clears throat> and are in particular have re reasonable claims, justifiable claims here. I think people all all claims to independence are justifiable as far as I'm concerned. But um, in this case, in particular, because of the massive organized systemic oppression that's going on in that region right now. Um, of those 12 million people, it appears that about 1.8 million, maybe as many as 2 million uh, of them have been sent to the internment camps that Nerola was just describing. Upwards of 2 million, according to government documents, have been sent to labor transfer programs that are essentially state-sponsored forced labor. And what I wanna talk about in a second is why, how do we understand what constitutes forced labor versus slavery versus, because I think that this is a live conversation that you all are having and that are useful uh, for talking about with students. This forced labor happens in a variety of different, through a variety of different mechanisms. There are, as, as, as uh, Nerilla showed, those pictures of satellite images. Those satellite images are, are internment camps that have factories inside them. So people who are in the internment camps just walk across the yard and are at work, essentially. Or maybe they'll walk across the street or through a tunnel or get on a bus and be taken directly to a, um, a, a work situation as a part of their internment. There are also people, like as, as Nerilla was describing, who are... Um, who are released or graduated from these vocational training schools, which we know to be internment camps. Um, they are extrajudicial uh, sentences that people are given to spend an un uh, undisclosed amount of time in these uh, camps uh, without having, many of whom haven't, uh, like Eve don't even have like a vague premise of a charge, much less an actual charge of a crime. But as a condition of release, sometimes people are assigned factory work or farm work or even like government office work if they're particularly skilled. Um, 
Some people are sent to, if they're not in the camps, they can be sent to a factory very, very close to their home. That's often called a, a factory on your doorstep. Uh, nobody wants that. Um, but other people are assigned to factories within the region of Xinjiang, and then others are assigned even further out, as, as Norella says, sometimes on a point system that determines how safe you are to send further out to international companies. The thing that's important to remember is that, well, let, let's say this, how does the PRC explain it? Well, they claim that the reason they, they want to do this is because there's a massive problem with terrorism. I've lived in that region. I can tell you there is not a massive problem with terrorism. There's a massive problem with colonialism in that area. And there are people who have um, responded to that in acts that are directed at the police, which does not constitute terrorism by any definition. Um, they have fought back from people arresting them or hurting them. And the kinds of fighting back that has happened is typically like with with scissors uh you know like they don't have access to guns there's no there there have been a couple of small makeshift bombs but like no more than in any other place in the world and what the chinese government has done in response to this is put millions of people into forced labor and millions of people into internment camps indiscriminately and so what they've done as narella says is justify this by saying if people refuse to alleviate their poverty then they must have been radicalized by uh, you know, Islamic terrorists and therefore they are terrorists and therefore to resist assignment to one of these factories is to resist the state and therefore is to be a terrorist and therefore everyone is terrified that if they were to do so, if they were to say no, they themselves would end up in internment camps. So all of these labor state sponsored labor programs that are positioned as poverty alleviation are actually operating on a backdrop of, of mass internment that everyone is terrified of. Everyone has a family member who's gone into the camps at this point. So, or, a, you know, a close friend. The government also claims that what they're doing is they're helping Uyghur people become less selfish, less lazy, less slow, less, in constant behavior. Oh, the, one problem is that they have they have desires for personal freedoms. And the Chinese government has used these labor programs to try to stop these things and to give them discipline instead. And you can see the kind of systemic racism that's at the heart of this whole project. And I can tell you that from living there, that one of the things that was most remarkable about it was just how much of a living colony it felt like. There was a constant sense of the, the rampant racism that Han people exhibited against Uyghurs. There was a sense that they were um, that they were lazy and slow, but they were also criminal. Essentially, they would rob you. But also, they had this sort of colonizing, um, exoticizing tropes of like the women are all beautiful and things like that. It is so like textbook colonial that I think any of us would recognize it when we're on the ground. But when you grow up there and you live there, it's just a fact of everyday life that people, that Uyghur people don't have the same opportunities, can't go to the same hotels, can't shop in the same places, can't go to the same college courses, can't wear what they want to wear when they go to school, can't, right? So it's like, I don't have promotion opportunities. It's written into the, the fabric of society in that region. And this is sort of a culmination of the worst possible um, dystopian reality of all those experiences. What I was going to do here was kind of walk through a description. Oh, the other thing that they argue, and this is a picture of the Emma Deans again, is that this is going to make Weaver people happier. It's going to make them healthier. It's going to make them less poor. And I submit to you that if you wanted to decrease poverty, you might stop discriminating against them in terms of college uh, admissions. You might allow them to study science. You might allow them to be entrepreneurs. You might uh, encourage uh, uh, certain kinds of like development opportunities. But instead, what's happened is that they've decided that the, sh the shift must be from farming uh, and, and, and ideological problematic behaviors to industrial labor, which will both make them economic citizens, ideological citizens, and productive members of society, and therefore happy, according to the, the propaganda about this. So how do we decide that this is forced labor? And this is what I started changing up really fast. What I want to say is that there are three terms, I think, that we use most often when it comes to these kinds of topics. Um, and I want to go through how we define them very quickly. Um, and I think that those terms are, are forced labor, slavery and trafficking. And these terms have a significant Venn diagram overlap, 
but they're not the same. And they're not the same in the way we, um, the way they're operationalized. And this is one of the things I try to teach my students. And so I suddenly started thinking like a teacher instead of like somebody trying to raise awareness. That's my dog. Um, instead of somebody trying to raise awareness about Uyghurs, I thought, okay, we've done some awareness raising. We've kind of given you a sense of what the situation is. Now thinking like a teacher, I'm thinking, okay, how do we use definitions to try to parse this and other situations of um, a forced labor. So when we talk about forced labor, one of the go-to definitions is to think about the ILO's definition of, of compulsory or forced labor. And they define it, I think, in very exacting and very simple, clear terms. It's, uh, you know, I'm, my picture, my own photo is covering it up, but it's when they're talking about somebody who does work, and I think work is an important point here, I should have it highlighted too, somebody who's doing work under threat of penalty, who has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. That's quite simple, it's quite clear. And I think that it covers most of the exa examples of forced labor that we can imagine in the world. So work under threat of penalty, not offering him or herself voluntarily. They have a list of indicators. We've identified many of these indicators in the work that people are doing in the, in the Uyghur region. But what I, what I think that we need to focus on and realize is that indicators are things you use, they're like red flags. They're a sign that you might be looking at a case of forced labor. But the definition really has to do with these main things. Under, somebody working oh, under threat of penalty who's not offered him or herself voluntarily. When the idea of modern slavery came about, it was largely... Um, uh, promoted by a sociologist named Kevin Bales. He uh, worked for a, a group called Free the Slaves. He ran, a, he started a group called Free the Slaves. This is one of their own slides. This is a Kevin Bales slide, his own. Um, and this has a, an old number, 27 million slaves. So you know how long I've had this slide. I had to dig all around to grab slides just now to, to throw them into this slideshow. So suddenly it's not all designy and looking like the other ones, but that's fine. So when he, started going around the world thinking about what constituted contemporary forms of slavery, what he, which he called modern day slavery. And he took a little bit of flack for that, for, for like differentiating between old and new slavery. And we can talk about that a little bit more, but the things he narrowed it down to look very much like the ILO definition, um, which comes from like 1930. He talked about people being forced to work without pay, which I think is controversial because even if you can't work, but the other, I mean, even if you get paid, but the other three categories are there, I think we're still talking about slavery. For the most part, when people are paid, they're paid only enough to keep eating till tomorrow, right? Um, but people who are forced to work under threat of violence and can't walk away. That's the part about the involuntariness. And I think that when we think about slavery or when we think about forced labor, the focus is on the effect, the experience of the person who's living it. So this is more of a sociological definition. It's a question of like, what happens to a person who is enslaved? And this is the thing that when I teach students, if I ask them to talk about what characterized slavery in the 19th century, they'll often talk about ownership. They'll describe chattel slavery, right? They'll describe ownership, inheritance. Um, violence is often a part of it. Um, they'll often talk about, they'll talk about sexual violence as well, but what, what really, what, what it really, at captivity, um, uh, slave ships, they'll, they'll think about these kinds of things, and I'll often do that, I'll often say, okay, what are the characteristics of 19th century slavery, and we put them on the board, and then I say, which of these are necessary characteristics, like, if, if rape weren't on the list, would it still be slavery, right, and so we narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down, and one of the things that's most important is that students almost never say the word work at first. But if it's sexual violence without work, then it's rape. If it's captivity without work, then it's ki kidnapping. If it's uh, 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 physical abuse without work, then it's physical abuse, uh, violence, right? But what, what is at the heart of slavery is work, is somebody being compelled to work. It's the same thing as with forced labor. Um, and that threat of violence is what maintains control, but it could be any number of things that maintain control. It could be the law, but the law is not necessarily the thing that maintains slavery. It could be violence, it could be drugs sometimes, it could be uh, coercion, it could be mental, uh, uh, psychological violence, um, but work and the inability to walk away from that work, I think is what really 
really constitutes forced labor. And this is why I've moved towards saying forced labor more often, because I think it really does say, okay, we're talking about these very specific aspects. Now, when we talk about trafficking, okay, I, I shouldn't have used this slide. I tried to make a slide myself. This is a sad, uh, quick move. But take away modern slavery here um, and put trafficking. The, this is the UK definition of modern slavery. But when we in the US, when we talk about human trafficking, we are talking about a legal statute. We're talking about a legal status. So we're no longer talking about the effect on the person or the experience of the person enslaved. We're now talking about the behavior of the person who is the criminal. Human trafficking is a legal category. And it talks about the recruitment movement, obtaining, harboring, receiving of people in the US. It's changed a little bit through force, fraud, or coercion. So force, fraud, or coercion. So this is about naming the legal um, dimensions and, and mechanisms by which someone enslaves another person or, or traffics another person. Slavery in a way, because the, the definition is kind of broader of trafficking, slavery could be seen as a subset of trafficking. People often say trafficking is a form of modern day slavery, but they are wrong. Modern day slavery is a form of trafficking. In the United States, trafficking also includes young people who are, uh, who are engaged in the exchange of sex, in the trade of sex, even if they haven't been compelled to do it by someone else. So that is a much, trafficking has a much broader umbrella um, than slavery does. So slavery within the United States terminology is a subset, but typically, like I said, when we talk about these two definitions, we're really kind of talking about two different ways of seeing the world through a sociological lens where you're thinking about the experience of the enslaved versus the, the legal experience, the, the kind of categories and definitions and terms that you need to meet the characteristics you need to meet to make a legal claim against someone who would be a trafficker. So most definitions of trafficking around the world are this kind of focus on the crime. In the UK and Australia, they use the word modern slavery in their definitions for what in other countries we use as trafficking. So I think this is interesting. Um, I, so this, I, I took this, this presentation in a totally different direction than I was planning to. Um, so I think this is interesting when we think about the case of, of, of Uyghur forced labor, because I think honestly, we could use any one of those three terms. In our work right now, the advocacy um, needs are so high that I have chosen as somebody who's a scholar of slavery, historical and, and contemporary, to, to focus on the term forced labor, because I know that in the United States, as Robbie was talking about, there is a sense in which the, the overuse of the word slavery, even to the point of it being a metaphor, right? My teacher's a slave driver, has in a way served to diminish the, um, the power of that word and the importance and the, the specificity of that word in the American context at the same time. The word slavery pre-existed the United States and unfortunately will follow our demise, will continue to, to, to exist after us most likely. Um, I am not one of those uh, anti-slavery activists who thinks we'll end slavery by 2035, which is a slogan that is very quickly going to become outdated, right? Um, but what we do know is that these are folks who are forced to work sometimes without pay, although sometimes not, they're not allowed to walk away. There's the constant threat of violence. We know that this is compulsory labor. We know that this is uh, people, if, even if they're unwilling, still have to do this work. And they're, that's under threat of penalty of going to these camps. And in terms of trafficking, there's certainly cases of force where people are like held captive in internment camps. There's definitely fraud where people are promised that they're going to have better lives and better situations. And there's certainly coercion where people go to people's house like they did with the Emma Deans and day after day after day after day harp on them and tell them this is what the government wants of you. And so all of these different terms are met. We use the word forced labor so that we don't distract from the issue, even though I believe that it is a it is a sign that we honor the experiences of people who've been enslaved throughout human history, that we name cases of slavery for what they are. But I admit that other people like me in my position and other advocates have so misused the word slavery to mean anything that they don't particularly like. 
to that we now have a situation where um, people are rightfully um, resistant to the, the expansion of that term. Um, so I think we've only been able to touch on the, the you know, broad contours of what's happening in the Uyghur region. Um, but I can also tell you like some of the things that you're seeing here, um, we had a case where like 1800 people were mass initiated into a, a labor program and transported across the country and forced to work. We've found uh, cases where people were forced to go uh, into labor programs. And then we find pictures of them literally making Skechers shoes. And we can find those exact pairs of shoes for sale in the US market. We, this is a, a, the, that blue man picture with the blue men lined up with the, the security guards behind them and the fencing. This is a factory across the street from that facility. And we found evidence that they were making hair uh, extensions for sale in the US market to African-Americans um, in, a, in a forced labor camp. And these are advertisements for batches of 50 to 100 Uyghur people to be sent to, to factories across the country. There is absolutely no question uh, in my mind or in any other expert's mind who's looked at this, that this is in fact slavery. but we uh, and uh, forced labor and trafficking. And what we're trying to do now is to figure out how to address it. Pam asked, uh, were, were any countries uh, successful at addressing this? And I would say that the advocacy efforts we've seen so far have made China admit that the camps exist. They have had to come, come out and start denying that, um, that this is forced labor. They've had to write all kinds of justifications of the, 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 the forced labor situation. One company that was named lost something like $56 million in sales last year. And that has significantly shaken up the industry of, of textiles. This was a cotton and textile company. So there are effects happening, but the Chinese government is reticent to admit that this is anything other than a positive uh, campaign to help people. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Um, and I, I appreciate yeah. both of you. You have so much to say and you I could tell you had to kind of rush through it, but I think um, that was really helpful.